Good afternoon. Welcome to the Guidance for Parks as an Essential Service Lecture Series. My name is Dr. Razani and I direct the Center for Nature and Health at UCSF. And we are absolutely thrilled that you can join us today. Um, I can see that we already have about 200 participants and the number is rising. Um, and I would like to really welcome our live audience, um, including colleagues at Parks and rec departments and agencies throughout the Bay Area, um, as well as people from throughout the nation, um, as well as all the other outdoor enthusiasts who are um, joining us and who have been corresponding with us over the last few days. Um, I'd also like to thank the partnering agencies um, that have helped create this lecture series, and they include um, the Association of Bay Area Health Officers, Healthy Parks, Healthy People Bay Area, Together Bay Area and the Bay Area Regional Health Equities Initiative. And um, really, I'd like to thank them not only for the series of meetings that we've had over the last few weeks, but also the last 10 years of relationship building um, that have initiated in, in a series such as this. Um, through our discussions and through corresponding with you, we have definitely felt the tension and the delicate balance between wanting to be part of managing um, an international pandemic and the spread of a communicable disease, um, while at the same time continuing to provide the public with opportunities for healing and for the opportunity to be in natural spaces. Um, we also know that parks are not just natural places. Uh, spaces, they are also people. Um, they are people that work there and people who are deeply invested in community um, and also deeply invested in nature. Um, so we definitely see health and parks as working together on a common mission of community health. And we hope that this lecture series will give you access to uh, some of the most up-to-date information um, and policies in order to best make the decisions that are in front of you. Uh, there will be three lectures. The first today um, is has the goal of presenting you with broad principles of epidemiology and biostatistics. Um, the second lecture, which will be next week at the same time and day, um, is about infection control. And then the third will discuss the role of parks in managing community stress during a pandemic. A few requests before we get started. Um, if you make your Zoom window a full screen, you'll see the slides better because the presenters will each have slides. Um, you will be on mute during the discussion, so please put your answers into the Q&A function. And a big thank you to Alice Kinner from East Bay Regional Park Districts, who is monitoring the questions for us today. Um, and we will post this video on YouTube in the upcoming days um, for those who want to spread it throughout their agencies. Um, we did send out a survey, and I thank um, the more than 100 people that have filled it out. We are going to try to address the questions that were listed there. And we also is ask you to please complete that survey if you have not yet, because that will help us tailor the rest of the lecture series to exactly what you need. Um, today's lecture will start with a series of three presentations. The first will be by George Rutherford, who will give us an update on where we are in the shape of the epidemic or pandemic and where we're likely to go as we get to the next stages. The next presentation, which will happen um, at around 2.25, um, will be by Dr. Kirsten Bibbins domingo who will present on the issue of health disparities in the COVID pandemic. Um, finally, at around 2.45, we'll be joined by Dr. Curtis Chan, who will update us on key COVID-19 documents that parks should know about, um, key concepts from health experts um, in order to plan park operations safely, and um, some approaches for how public health and parks can work together. The final 25 minutes will be a panel discussion and question and answer, um, and for that we'll be joined by Dr. Rohan Radhakrishna, um, who is a Deputy Health Officer from Contra Costa County. So with that, let's move to our first speaker. Um, George Rutherford is a renowned professor 
um, who's well known to those of you who've been following the news on this pandemic. He's a professor in the Department of Epidemiology and Biostatistics here at UCSF. Um, and he's an expert in infectious disease epidemics and control and epidemiology. He's also the former state health officer for California. Welcome, Dr. Rutherford. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure. And I'm, I'm glad my boss is here to hear that I'm a renowned epidemiologist. That's good. <laughs> um, <laughs> let, me, uh, let me share my screen uh, with you, and we'll get, uh, we'll get, off, get off and crack in here. So um, just wanted to today give you an update on COVID-19 and a few aspects that you may not have heard before, but sort of some of the inside baseball uh, stuff. This is not inside baseball. This is pretty big picture stuff. There have been 3.2 million uh, COVID deaths as of 6.30 this morning, Pacific time, and uh, almost 230,000 deaths worldwide. Note over here that the United States has uh, about a third of all cases of COVID in the world, uh, followed by uh, Europe, and then way down here distantly after Iran is China, which uh, where, is where it started uh, for a long time as I've been following this. China had about 90, 90, 97, 98% of all cases in the world, and it's now just totally eclipsed by Europe and the US. The, uh, in the Bay Area, um, knowing that this is a Bay Area audience, I put up the numbers uh, for, all the, uh, for all the counties in the Bay Area. Um, and I'm sorry, Santa Cruz. Um, anyway, this is the, to the totals across the, uh, across the counties. And there are uh, 200, there's 7,416 cases in the Bay Area and uh, uh, 1,400 and 90 deaths uh, to date. And you can see here, this is the number of cases per day that have been smoothed out into uh, a so-called seven-day moving average um, that uh, we're on a downslope since uh, early first week of April in terms of total cases. But you also see these spikes through it, which re represent uh, outbreaks in say nursing homes, homeless shelters, places like that. Oh, and I should mention that Santa Clara has far and away the largest number of cases, but is also the largest county, followed by Alameda, the city, San Francisco, San Mateo, Contra Costa, and down the line. This shows you the San Francisco cases uh, with, again, a peak in um, uh, early April, or April 6th to the 12th that week. Uh, the last bar here the, for the current week is projected out, uh, prorated across the number of days. But it's still, you can see the pretty clear decline going on. Now, this is what we're trying to avoid. This is a graph of the number of deaths due to infectious diseases in the United States by a year uh, from 1900 to 1996. Uh, and this is mortality per 100,000 persons per year. And so you can see this big spike here, obviously, in, uh, which corresponds to the 1918-1919 influenza pandemic. For people who do what I do, we know about the 1918-1919 influenza in exquisite detail because it's where all the lessons, the big lessons come from. And uh, believe me, they've been trotted out uh, on multiple occasions uh, during this pandemic as well. So what are our goals in, in, a, in a pandemic? Well, the first is to limit new cases by reducing the effective reproductive number. I'll talk a little bit about this metric in a second, but suffice it to say here that the effective reproductive number or the reproductive number or the basic reproductive number, R sub zero, refers to the number of secondary cases that occur as a result of any one person being sick. So if one person uh, infects three people, uh, if you average that across a population, the basic reproductive number would be three, okay? The other thing we wanna do is flatten and prolong the outbreak to assure that we have, and this is the so-called flatten the curve, which is not the world's best analogy, especially for those of you who, who have vague memories of calculus. Uh, it's not the same area under the curve. There are fewer cases 
the peak is much lower uh, and it's spread out over a longer period of time. The reason we do that is because if the peak is too high, our health systems will be overwhelmed. As you, you saw in Italy and in, in China, in Italy, in Spain, and now in, uh, in New York and a few other places. Currently, there's an out of control outbreak on the Navajo Reservation in, in New Mexico and Arizona. Uh, so we want to assure that you have adequate health care uh, resources. And then we also want to buy time for antivirals and eventually for a vaccine to be developed. So by pushing this out off to the right-hand side, essentially, um, we're, we're uh, limiting the damage that it does to health, not to the economy, but to health, uh, and trying to create uh, enough room so that we can get antiviral drugs. As you all may know, there was a semi breakthrough yesterday uh, at the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, which is part of the National Institutes of Health in Bethesda, Maryland. Uh, they found a uh, anti broad spectrum antiviral drug called remdesivir, which is, was originally formulated for Ebola virus uh, to be effective in uh, both reducing the time to recovery, and that was redu reduced from 15 days to 11 days, and also reducing mortality, uh, which was uh, had a, uh, uh, was reduced, I'm not gonna remember, I think it was from 18% to 11%. They weren't huge increases, right? There's still a lot of people who are on the bad side of those equations, uh, but the, the point is, is that it's progress, you know, we now have a drug that works. And so the next trial will look at that drug versus that drug plus another. So we'll get into moving to more and more combination therapy. Now the effective reproductive number is to sort of take on the basic reproductive number and it brings into play this, uh, the, the variable of population uh, susceptibility. So it's the product of the number of contacts per day, the pr probability of infection per contact, which we can decrease by wearing personal protective equipment, personal hygiene, et cetera. The infectious period, how long people are infectious before they, uh, before they stop becoming infectious. And for COVID-19, people are probably infectious for up to two days before they develop symptoms and for seven to eight days afterwards. Uh, the way we uh, deal with the infectious period, to sh by the way we shorten the infectious period is not to shorten the period that a person's infected, but we shorten the period that they are exposed to others by doing things like isolation, uh, for instance. Okay, And then finally, the last part of this uh, product is population susceptibility. Uh, and really what we're talking about here is vaccination. Now here's a graphic depiction of flattening the curve. The idea here is that we push out to the right, we delay the peak of the epidemic, and we reduce the healthcare uh, utilization to something that we can handle, okay? Um, all right, now the problem with all this is that there's a back-end risk, and that's of a secondary, um, that's of secondary attack rate. Now this is assuming that people who become infected become immune, which is not a necessarily a true assumption. We know of some relatively large number of people who become immune, I'm sorry, who become, uh, who have recovered from infection, have antibody, right? Uh, but are not immune. Their, their antibody, they don't have the right kinds of antibodies. The right kind are called neutralizing antibody. So you can see here, this is the red line is with usual epidemic, it comes, it goes, okay? Um, the green is what we want. We want a flat curve that has a long right-hand tail on it. The blue is what we have to worry about, that we have this kind of rapidly expanding epidemic. We blunt it, we got this long kind of drawn out tableau here into the fall. And then all of a sudden you start to get a second wave of infection. And that's because susceptibles have built up and most likely kids have gone back to school and are transmitting the disease to each other. So what are the, some of the lessons we take home from the 1918-1919 influenza pandemic? 
The first is, this is a classic graph and it depicts mortality in St. Louis in red and in Philadelphia in blue. And I'll show you a little bit more about this later, but suffice it to say that Philadelphia enacted control measures like we're doing now at about halfway up this mortality curve. St. Louis did it more like we did and they did it before it had become an issue. And you can see that St. Louis had many fewer cases. They in fact, fat, blah, blah, blah. They in fact flattened the curve. The curve. Uh, but what you can also see is, was that there was a rebound in mortality as they took their foot off the brake and started to let people go forward. There was a rebound in mortality. The mortality rates went up and then they finally came down again. So when we're talking about this disease, how can we mitigate it at the population level? Well, there are two things. One is containment, and that's something that uh, is done with individuals. So for somebody who's infected, they would be isolated. For someone who's exposed, um, they, uh, they would be quarantined, which can be either voluntary or involuntary. We do all sorts of infection control in hospitals and other sorts of facilities. We also have basic activities like public information and education, promoting respiratory hygiene, that is coughing into your elbow and uh, frequent hand washing, keep your hands away from your face, stay inside if you're sick, all those sorts of things. Um, and then individual measures to increase social distance, which is to tell people to stand, stand six feet apart. Then there's mitigation, which are community-wide measures to increase social distance. Things like telecommuting, banning mass gatherings, banning large gatherings, businesses, schools, and transit closures. Um, and then we move to widespread quarantine, which is what we're in, which is uh, also known as shelter in place or stay at home. And then eventually there's a, there's a, a third piece of this, I'm sorry, a uh, fifth piece of this about closing borders, which is something we don't do very often, but now all the US borders are, are closed except for essential travel. And I note that Hawaii has begun a 14 day quarantine period for visitors. I, I merely show you this, this is the back to the R sub E, the, the effective reproductive number here in the box on the right. And what we can say is that before January 23rd, which was the date that Wuhan went to lockdown, this was um, quite a bit before, and this was way before, this is the first week of quarantine, and this is the second week of quarantine. So it went from, um, you know, a basic reproductive number of somewhere around 3.86 to 1.26 to 0 0.32, which is extremely low. That means, so 0 0.32 again means for every one index case, there are 0 0.32 people who become infected. Now, there's a, there's a variety of empirical evidence that social distancing works. This, I think, is the most uh, compelling. These are two almost adjacent provinces in the Lombardy region of Italy. Think of them like San Francisco and, and Santa Clara. They're almost the same, almost touching. So in one place, Lodi, not Lodi, uh, went to shelter in place early and blunted transmission. And you can see how flat their transmission is relative to Bergamos, where, where they didn't go to shelter in place until February, until um, yeah, February, um, March 9th. Okay. <clears throat> now, there are some programs that, we, that we're uh, experimenting with that can look at R0 uh, by state uh, with input confidence intervals around it. Here you can see California, over here the uh, sixth from the left, uh, and I think we're, we and maybe Michigan and maybe Idaho, maybe South Dakota, all this was before the meatpacking plant outbreaks. Uh, Georgia are all statistically significantly below one. Okay. Now I couldn't resist uh, having, having the Bergamo and Lodi slide. I couldn't resist putting it up for San Francisco and Los Angeles. This is not a totally fair comparison, but it's fair. Um, and you can see how flat the curve is in San Francisco compared to what looks like in Los Angeles. These big spikes out here in Los Angeles uh, more recently 
are from uh, not from uh, are from outbreaks in homeless shelters. Now, this is an interesting thing published by the Centers for Disease Control. It kind of looks across the uh, spectrum in San Francisco. This dotted line is the change uh, over three days in the number of reported cases. So this is a way just of making that curve a little smoother. And you can show, see that it's declining. Okay. Um, this is the, uh, this is the uh, uh, let's see where the case counts. This is the cumulative number of cases here, right? And this is the proportion of people who leave home at any given time uh, on any one day. And you can see it used to be like 80%, and now it's down to 50% with some up and down to it. Okay, so the shelter in place order um, of, of, that's coming up on May 4th has some changes in it. Right? And one of the changes that eases is outdoor activities. And I'm sure you're as well as aware of this as I am. But the way the, the order read was, second, the order allows more outdoor recreation activities to occur again so, again, so long as they can be done safely without physical contact, shared equipment, or use of high touch areas and recreation facilities. Then it went on that these, are, these include sunbathing, hiking, golf, skateboarding and fishing. These activities must be done in compliance with social distancing and sanitation protocols for any facilities that are used during uh, for those activities. I see, I thought they should add surfing on this list, but that starts to get to the beach problem. Now, this is a serious big lesson. In 1918, San Francisco was one of the leaders in preventing new infections uh, and was doing quite well relative to what was projected to happen. Uh, and remember, San Francisco as a port, uh, was a, a major transshipment uh, area for all sorts of cargo going out, not so much for World War I in Europe, but for, uh, but for the uh, war that Japan was largely fighting against German colonies in the Pacific. Um, so uh, there was a, a predicted to be a huge problem with uh, influenza in San Francisco. And in fact, it was quite successfully blunted. That is until uh, November 21st, 1918, where the city council got rid of the, or the uh, Board of Health uh, got rid of the order that ordered people to wear masks and shelter indoors. And there was a giant, so at noon on the 21st of November, whistles blew citywide and people threw away their masks. And it's the, the, the description in the Chronicle from that day, from the next day said that they, you know, were, they covered the sidewalks and ran down into the gutters. But here's some families having, doing the throw away your mask bit. And there were throw away your mask parties like all night long. Within eight weeks, there have been 3,000 deaths in San Francisco and, and basically all the advantage that had been conferred by earlier sheltering in place had been lost. So the lesson here, as with St. Louis, is if you have a good thing going, don't stop in the middle of it. Don't just flip a switch and go back. And this just shows you, this, is, this green was what was predicted. And here's San Francisco, the red was what actually happened. So you can see how good a job they did. They prevented about two thirds of the deaths, okay? But then there was a second big peak out here and they ended up totally with uh, 3,000 subsequent deaths out in this part of the curve. Whereas St. Louis had the little bump I showed you before and Philadelphia, which had a horrendous outbreak uh, with a very high mortality, uh, fell, uh, it fell and then stayed down pretty much uh, afterwards. So this second peak here, this is the second wave. This is what you need to be looking at and needing to be paying attention to. Okay, so just to reiterate general advice, work from home if, you're, if you can. Uh, make sure your family has all the essential meds, prepare a childcare plan, make arrangements uh, for childcare closure, right? Be, be able to take care of people on your own uh, and um, clean surfaces uh, frequently. So I will stop there. Nusheen, thank you very much. And I'll hang for questions. Actually, George, thank you so much. Um, 
That was incredibly useful um, and to help us wrap our head around um, what this stage and next stages will look like. Um, we are going to invite you back for the panel to answer questions. And that will be at, at 3.05. Thank Don't worry, you. I won't be late. I won't be late. Okay. <laughs> Thank you again. Um, our next speaker is Dr. Kirsten Bivens Domingo. Um, she is professor and chair of the Department of Epidemiology and Biostatistics at UCSF. She's also vice dean for Population Health and Equity. Um, she's an international leader in issues surrounding health disparities and social determinants of health. Um, I know public parks, even the ones that some may consider tiny ones in neighborhoods, um, are each deeply invested in the communities they serve. And so we really appreciate your presence today um, to talk about this very important issue of disparities in COVID-19. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Rosani. I really appreciate it. And thank you for the invitation. Can you see my slides? Yes. OK, terrific. Uh, great. So. Here's what we know. We know that there are already patterns um, that tell us that the impact of COVID-19 is felt in some communities more than in others. We don't have the full picture because of substantial data limitations and because we are not testing completely and because we're not reporting everywhere across the country, but we know that these patterns have already emerged. This is what we saw at the end of March uh, for several cities that you could see when cases were overlaid on the demographics of certain parts of the city. Here in Milwaukee, you can see that the cases really clustered in the areas of town that have had higher African-American populations. At the beginning of April, we had reports from several cities around the country um, that uh, African-Americans um, seem to be overrepresented in the deaths from COVID-19 compared to their representation in the population. And what we know now based on uh, data that has amassed uh, across the country and compiled here in a graph from the Kaiser Family Foundation. Um, what you see here in the orange are the states where the proportion of African American uh, uh, amongst COVID deaths is twice that of their representation in the population within these states. So one example just showing the disproportionate impact uh, here in particular in African-American communities. In New York City, where we know a city that has been uh, substantially affected by, by uh, this virus, and that uh, a city that is reporting its numbers uh, adjusted for the size of the population and also age adjusted, you see here that African-American and Latino communities have twice uh, have substantially higher um, uh, rates of disease, whether it's non-hospitalized COVID disease, hospitalized COVID disease, or deaths from, from uh, the coronavirus. In California, we see a similar uh, pattern emerging. In California, and I'll focus you here just on the, the far right column, is the percentage of each population, uh, each group within the population, and then immediately adjacent to it is the percentage among deaths. And the things uh, that have been most striking when you look at the California in its totality is that African Americans and Native Hawaiian or Pacific Islanders are two groups um, where uh, their representation among the deaths is at least two or three times as great as uh, their representation in the population. In San Francisco, what we know is that, um, that uh, the Latino Latinx community has been disproportionately impacted here. Here we're looking at cases, not deaths, but you see here that, um, that Hispanic or Latino uh, um, individuals represent 32% of the cases um, compared to their representation in the population of about 15 to 16%. And this is a map of San Francisco, two day, a few days old now, uh, but 
at uh, showing the general pattern, which has stayed pretty similar uh, in San Francisco for the distribution of cases across the city, uh, greatest in those areas that are more deeply colored uh, blue. We have very few deaths in San Francisco, fortunately, but it's notable that uh, most of the deaths are in people over 60, and in those, um, 12 of the 23 deaths are among Asian residents, and um, statewide, it's been notable that these are, uh, that uh, Asian women predominate in this group, and that's notable because across the board, there seems to be a slight more male predominance than female predominance, except for this particular group. The other communities and uh, groups that are disproportionately affected, we already know about the risk in uh, congregate settings where people are living close together. We all found out about the coronavirus um, uh, in part because of outbreaks on cruise ships. We know that in the US, uh, nursing homes uh, were, uh, were some of the first cases up in Washington. In San Francisco, the congregate settings that um, have been particularly notable are the homeless shelters. Again, being homeless is not itself a risk. It's, it's that um, those who are homeless are oftentimes um, uh, sheltering in an area where they're living cl very closely together, which puts them at a higher risk of exposure. And another similar type of congregate setting would be jails. Here's a really striking graph, not from here, but from New York State. And you can see the red and yellow lines show the high rates of uh, uh, coronavirus infection uh, the cases um, in the state and in the city, but the blue line shows uh, the rates in um, uh, the Riker jail system. And jails are important because people move in and out of jails, um, and because uh, in both of these types of congregate setting jails, um, uh, homeless shelters, we have people who are also working um, in these settings and often working in multiple of these types of setting. So um, the, the people who live in these settings are at risk as well as the people who care for them or who work in those settings as well. So we're seeing patterns of health inequities. And um, I think most, uh, most people who study health inequities uh, um, are not surprised by this. Uh, health inequities are common, they're large, and they are pervasive. And the people who study this and the theories behind this note that regardless of disease or context, we see over and over again that some individuals and groups can flexibly use resources to avoid risk and mitigate the effects of poor health. And um, these resources might be money, they might be power, knowledge, prestige, or social connections. And when these are absent, that's when we see disproportionate burdens of disease. And some factors that are really the most upstream factors that responsible for this include po poverty and systemic racism. These are nicely discussed in many articles that have been published. This is one in the New Yorker published earlier this month. And if you look at the words of uh, Dr. Kamara Jones, who's the former head of the American Public Health Association, she reminds us that pandemics are no great equalizer uh, and COVID-19 has washed away any veneer of equal opportunity or equal risk in the population. So let's explore just a little bit of why, uh, what, what factors might contribute to disparities. I think of this, and if you uh, think back to what Dr. Rutherford was talking about, there, there are sort of three big buckets of things that put people at increased risk. The increased likelihood of being exposed to the virus, greater susceptibility to severe disease, and uh, limitations in accessing health care. And those three factors come together um, to, I think, give us the patterns that we're starting to see in particular communities. So very specifically though, when we think about um, likelihood of exposure, I think we remember that um, probably six months ago, none of us knew what flatten the curve or social di distancing really meant. Um, and now we're very proficient in this language. But those types of concepts have to be communicated to all of our communities and um, don't translate necessarily in the same way in other languages, in other cultures. And um, oftentimes uh, um, the, the institutions that are communicating might be institutions that particular communities don't have a lot of trust in. So misinformation and mistrust is, is an unfortunate uh, byproduct of a lot of uh, 
the urgent communication that happens in these types of settings. One example here um, is, uh, this is Idris Elba, when he was diagnosed with uh, uh, um, the coronavirus infection, he um, used his uh, bully pulpit to talk about um, this theory that had been circulating amongst African and African American communities that somehow black skin uh, led you to be immune to this type of infection. It turns out that these theories of immunity related to the skin color um, have a long and unfortunate history in the US. This is from the yellow fever epidemics in the 1800s where blacks were thought to be immune and this was used as a justification for why they could continue to care for other people who were um, get falling sick with yellow fever. And while it's really uh, difficult to figure out the sources of misinformation um, and to disentangle those, I think we can all agree that, um, that the early uh, labeling and continued labeling in some circles of this virus as a China virus, a Chinese virus, uh, has led to a, a large degree of uh, xenophobia and targeting of, of Asian and Asian American populations um, that has an unfortunate effect in those communities and also contributes to uh, misinformation in other communities about communicating underlying risk. Another thing that puts people at risk for exposure is that it actually takes resources to stay socially distanced. So this graph is, was published in the New York Times and is actually looking at cell phone data because we can all tell where everybody is from their cell phone data. And these uh, downward slopes uh, show how people have started to shelter in place. And what you see in the blue lines is what happens in wealthier parts of town. And in the orange lines, what happens in poorer parts of town across 20 large uh, urban settings. And what we see here consistently is that wealthier areas of the city shelter earlier and they shelter longer. Why might this be? In poorer areas of the town, we know we have increasing housing density. We know we also have more people living within a, a given housing unit. As the, this shelter in place has uh, lasted longer, there's the greater need in those areas where you're not necessarily having groceries delivered to leave for services, to leave to, to uh, find food in many cases. And we also know that many people are not telecommuting and continue to work. And uh, amongst our essential workforce include our low wage essential workforce, many people who are working in transit, in retail, in food service or food production, and in healthcare. And all of these types of, of, of um, essential uh, work during this time puts people at increased risk of exposure. In the susceptibility category, we also know that there are certain types of underlying conditions that put you at higher risk of having a severe complication from COVID-19 or dying from COVID-19. Um, and we know that many of these conditions, high blood pressure, heart disease, asthma, diabetes, kidney disease, those are, um, those are diseases that are more common in minority communities and more common in poor communities generally. We also know that these conditions tend to be, um, happen at younger ages. And one of the things that is really striking when you look at um, the breakdown now of people who get this disease at ages younger than 50, so between 18 and 49, is that's where you see the starkest difference between um, the representation of each of these groups in the population and their representation amongst death, amongst deaths from COVID-19. And many people hypothesize that it is uh, the higher burden of underlying uh, chronic conditions in many of our minority and poor communities that put them at risk for uh, deaths from uh, this, this infection. The last set of categories I'd highlight are things related to access to healthcare. So we know that the, the testing for uh, the coronavirus is not uh, as widely available as we'd like it to be. Um, and uh, early on um, in LA, uh, it was wealthier areas of LA that had the highest rates of coronavirus, but that mostly, most likely had to do with the fact that um, 
that that's where the testing sites were. It was much more easy. It was much easier to get tested in those areas of town. Now that there's more testing more widely available throughout LA, what you see is that the cases have actually shifted to poor parts of town. And I think that just reflects availability of testing. We also know that much of our testing has happened in the context of a healthcare evaluation, somebody evaluating whether you have symptoms and therefore need a test. And that raises concerns for people who don't have insurance or may perceive other types of barriers to care. And although we don't have the data yet, um, I think many people who are thinking about um, what's necessary to care for people with severe uh, coronavirus, uh, COVID-19 disease, is um, that there may be bias or lack of availability of things like ventilators and other types of treatment um, that uh, may put people at risk for, um, uh, for severe outcomes. So what do we have to do? One of the things that we know we need, and luckily we've been able to get more and more information about it, is just really the data on who's actually affected by, uh, by uh, coronavirus infection. Um, so there's an urgent need for high quality data, an urgent need for timely data, and data that really allows us to understand where in our communities and who in our communities is at highest risk. Luckily, that has, um, that we've started to get much more of that. And, really want to, to uh, appreciate um, the, the data that's being made available in California and many of our, our local um, departments of public health releasing the data and releasing it in ways that I think are very accessible on the website to really understand uh, which communities and which individuals are, are being affected. There's an urgent need to address gaps in communication uh, in testing and in care to affected communities. And I just will highlight here some that, of things that we've been involved with at UCSF, many of them in partnership with community organizations and with the Department of Public Health. Uh, one here is uh, many of you are aware that there was um, a massive testing uh, effort in the mission this past weekend, just ended on Tuesday. Um, I think they, they screened uh, 4,200 individuals. Uh, um, with both uh, coronavirus the viral testing as well as um, antibody testing. Um, I think this was really instigated when we, we had the data and the confirmation that our Latinx communities were being disproportionately impacted by, by this infection. We have several uh, groups at UCSF that work with particular uh, populations of high risk Amend at UCSF is a criminal justice reform program, and um, the Benioff Homelessness Housing Initiative is uh, focused on those uh, groups that are experiencing homelessness. And both have been involved in uh, providing consultation, as well as doing webinars and other types of trainings for people who work in settings uh, with these populations that we know are at higher risk. Our Latinx Center of Excellence has had a, a, a robust COVID response, providing expertise, education, and also uh, research, um, and really partnering with DPH and the community-based organizations to, to get the word out. And this is just some examples of some of our faculty uh, doing uh, this work uh, with uh, community-based organizations. And then uh, lastly, I want to focus on the ongoing need to address the social factors that influence health. Uh, uh, those are food, uh, housing, education. We, as you all have already said, we're, this is not a sprint, this is sort of a marathon. And we're entering this marathon at a time when we, we have the, the pandemic we're worried about, as well as the economic recession that we're worried about. And we know that the disparities that we're observing in infection overlay on top of disparities in underlying health states that already exist. And that's one of the reasons I really want to, uh, to, um, to thank all of you who are on this call and really thinking about uh, the way uh, green spaces, open spaces within our city uh, contribute to health and what we can do because we do need a plan to think about this and access to these in all of our communities as we can safely do it. Um, one of the things that we've been focused on also is uh, um, access to uh, nutritional resources. And this is our Vouchers for Veggie or EDSF program um, and uh, um, that provides uh, vouchers for fruits and vegetables to uh, low-income households or those experiencing 
to food insecurity. And I think this need uh, that's being addressed by many organizations in our area is, is just one example of the important ways we have to think about the long-term impacts of health, particularly in the communities disproportionately affected by the infection. So two take home points. Um, one is that the pandemic uh, ends up exposing deep inequities that already existed uh, amongst us. So although COVID-19 can affect everyone, the impact of this pandemic will not be felt equally across all groups. And managing the pandemic then requires a real focus amongst, uh, on the most marginalized amongst us. The second is that the pandemic also forces us to understand our interrelatedness, particularly here in the Bay Area. All of us who are thinking about the people who are essential workers at this time know that that includes many, many people from many different communities. And if we're going to protect our Bay Area, really requires a focus that on understanding how all of our communities can remain safe. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Bibbins Domingo. Um, I really hear that data as a call to action um, to make sure that, you know, what was the status quo before COVID, um, the things that were wrong about it are actually corrected. And I know that a lot of people on this call have actually devoted their careers and their lives to increasing access to nature across many communities. And, um, I know that as this discussion moves forward, they will be very interested in balancing the need for infection control with um, the need for equity and access to nature. Um, so thank you again very much, and we will be hearing from you again during the panel. Great, thank you. Thank you. Um, Dr. Bibbins Domingo mentioned our interrelatedness. And um, our next speaker, Dr. Curtis Chan, has for a very long time been a champion of creating uh, regional policies, both in health and in parks, because of the ways in which we are all um, affected by policies in one area. Um, Dr. Chan serves as the medical director of um, maternal, child, and adolescent health, and also as the deputy health officer for the San Francisco Department of Public Health. He's also been at the forefront of um, collaborations between park agencies and health agencies um, for more than 10 years and helped create Healthy Parks, Healthy People um, about 10 years ago. Um, welcome, Dr. Chan, and thank you. Uh, thanks so much for having me and um, the Bay Area Health Officers be part of this. And thank you so much to UCSF, uh, Dr. Bibbins Domingo, and Dr. Rutherford for uh, your leadership throughout. Um, the San Francisco Bay Area and the state, uh, not just for this pandemic, but, so, but for so many issues that affect health equity. And really just a huge amount of gratitude for all the park staff. It looks like there's like 450 people on or over 400 people on. So we really appreciate your interest in public health. I'm gonna click on this. So there's three takeaway points. Um, one is that this is a three part series so I just want to introduce you to some of the key COVID-19 reference documents that you could read in between these three weekly sessions. Um, and just to endorse that these are documents that local public health departments are relying upon. They're, they're excellent, they're, all, they're mostly all from the CDC. So I'm just going to highlight them, take some snapshots of them so that you at least have a place to start from um, and just to ensure you that they're reliable we're actually utilizing the same documents the same the second aspect is to contextualize the concepts that uh dr bibbins domingo and dr rutherford just highlighted and just into these three basic approaches of how health officers of the bay area and park agency directors the county agency directors and the uh, regional parks are working together. And we would love to have your participation as well by sending your questions to us so that we can really answer them um, and take your lead in developing our uh, frequently asked and answered questions. And, um, and finally, you know, I think these concepts of a uh, effective reproductive number that Dr. Rutherford highlighted and how Dr. Bibbins Domingo highlighted uh, racial disparities in deaths, in testing, in chronic disease, in 
social inequities and resources which lead to toxic stress. And that is really the pandemic right now. There is that pandemic of toxic stress that's really inequitably distributed. But fortunately, why I'm so glad that I'm here is that we're talking to the, the only resource that's available um, in every city and every county that we as taxpayers pay for are our parks. So uh, we're so grateful uh, that you're participating with us. And I think um, the public has really voted with their feet. Uh, we've really seen uh, in the last you know, five weeks now, uh, 50 days actually, that uh, parks is the one respite that people are actually seeking um, to shelter themselves from this toxic stress. So, and this is um, this um, huge demand for parks is something we kind of had a sense of, um, but it's going to stay because as uh, Dr. Rutherford uh, explained, this is a flattened and prolonged curve. And with so many of the usual places that we go for recreation and leisure closed, um, everybody is going to be going to parks. So this is why it really requires the emergency response. So here's the first concept. From, this is from the CDC's website for public health recommendations for community related exposure. So this is the reason of like how parks and public health might be interacting, but we want to in, avoid these difficult in, interactions. I mean, this is more akin to like what Disneyland probably has to think about. So this is a basic concept about contact investigation in an official CDC slide. So let's say somebody gets reported to us in this middle column. This is a person with symptomatic COVID-19 symptoms and then we get that positive test and then we're asked to do this contact investigation which is what you're hearing about from pe even people like uh, Governor Newsom. From, from that point the public health department then works with either on our own or like with let's say an indoor park facility or sometimes even like a, a, a business and then we ask and then because we need to find all the people that that's, that um, symptomatic or actually infectious person was in close contact with. And that row of close, close contact is in that left row of persons. Because once we contact those people on that left row, we need to tell them to do everything on the right, I mean, the right column. It's to stay home for 14 days, right? So, um, so everything on the left column um, is the, the people that businesses, and in some cases, let's say if it was zoos, um, or even an indoor facility of a park, or let's say a miniature golf place, would need to contact with. So the public health department is gonna contact every household member, the intimate partner, or any individual providing um, care in the household, like a home health worker. And this is that fourth bullet right here. This is the key thing. This is the CDC definition individual who has had close contact in parentheses less than six feet for a prolonged period of time and this is that concept of the effective reproductive number that uh, george was talking about is number of contacts per day so if this person for example was like um, so I, i'll give this example so what what do those two asterisks mean so this is the next uh, slide so the first asterisk is that so it's not as simple as less than six um, feet away. And this hopefully will figure, you'll figure out some things about like the width of the trails, um, you know, picnic benches and all these things. These are the basic concepts. So as opposed to like the inf influenza, the CDC says the data is still, we're still learning more about it. So it's still limited to actually define close contact. But these are some of the factors to consider when defining a close contact. So these are the things you could be telling your staff, telling yourself, uh, as you know, I try not to be so anxious when I'm walking um, in parks as well too. And how do we communicate this and messages as, as, as Kirsten was saying to the general public? So it's not just six feet, it's not just the proximity, but also the duration of exposure. Is it like a runner running by, a bicyclist quickly going by? You know, how, how long is that duration of exposure? 
and whether the person has symptoms or not. You know, the definitions of close contact, you know, classically being three feet away, which was doubled to be conservative to be six feet away, was really for people who are symptomatic, coughing, and not wearing a mask. So, you know, those standards are really for um, this, as you can see here, coughing likely increases exposure, as does things like a big sneeze as well. And also whether the individual is wearing a mask. So, you know, so these are some of the major factors that the health officers and we as a society now already almost have in place, and the parks have this in place too. The second aspect here is, uh, with three asterisks, are, uh, this is cut and pasted from the CDC because this is important to know as official language, so I'll just actually read it. Um, and this helps us to communicate to people, you know, like if I'm passing by somebody on a trail, how worried should I be? So data are insufficient to precisely define the duration of time that constitutes a prolonged exposure. Recommendations vary on the length of time of exposure from 10 minutes or more to 10, 30 minutes or more. In healthcare settings, it is reasonable to define a prolonged exposure as any exposure greater than a few minutes because the contact is someone who is ill, and it's usually with the person who's providing care and listening with a stethoscope in that person's grill, basically. Brief interactions are less likely to result in transmission. However, symptoms of the type of interaction, did the person cough directly into the face of the individual, remain important. So for example, if you're at a, uh, at a ticket booth um, and, it's, and you're, somebody is handing you fees for the park and that person's not wearing a mask and the parking attendant is also not wearing a mask and at that exact time the person coughs directly into that person's face you know that might be an exposure right so um, these this is the official guidelines and we're still learning so much from this uh, virus that we're really humbled and we really want to learn from you what's the best way that we could implement this type of guidance and also provide you with with real data and real scientific guidance as it comes along so we try to apply this. So this, for example, on 8th, April 8th was um, Dr. Rohan, who's going to be with us later. He and Dr. Farnatano provided um, a letter to East Bay Regional Parks just stating the importance of parks staying open. And this had two goals. You can see down here, it's minimizing transmission of communicable disease to staff and public, while also safeguarding these essential services of outdoor recreation that's really crucial for those things that Dr. Bibbins Domingo highlighted. It's uh, inequities of mental health, emotional health, and physical health for community members. How do we balance the two? How do we make sure both of them actually take place? So after that came out, just two days afterwards, the CDC guidance for park administrators came out, which actually had very similar language uh, with the planning document that we were, that, that, that we're going to share with you. I think our planning document goes a little bit more into the nitty gritty, and we want to continue to, to develop this with the park directors and also with the park staff as well too. But I just want to let you know that, that guided, this guidance, there's about three guidance documents for parks that's actually on the CDC website. And in general, we agree, and we as the health officers agree with all the points. And uh, you can see from right here, and we've had four meetings uh, between uh, four health officers uh, led by uh, Dr. Matt Willis, health officer in Marin County, Dr. Erica Pond, interim health officer for Alameda County, uh, Dr. Rohan and, and myself um, in Contra Costa and San Francisco to work with uh, park directors across, uh, across the region. And we came up with this, this like regional consensus on planning for this early May period in which you just saw the health officer orders being released yesterday. So I just want to let you know that we're working together. Um, I, I really do appreciate that the park directors really thinking hard about uh, wanting to protect staff. At the same time, also wanting to provide services for the community and the demands of the community. Uh, we've been working with Together Bay Area to try to include more parks and open spaces as well, as well as Bar High to make sure there's a, a um, a, a, a health equity focus as well. And we're so grateful for UCSF Center for Nature and Health that's bringing in science, science leaders from UCSF into this discussion. 
So I think I, in the interest of time, I won't read the actual consensus statement, um, but the three approaches to ensuring that this is an essential service is, the, the first issue is just to remember that there's an unprecedented demand and need for parks. Like the preparation for parks, I think is almost as consequential and needs to happen as much as for, for example, in medicine, all of outpatient care has transformed into telemedicine to by video. Um, what restaurants had to transform the entire businesses to um, takeout services. So hospitals have had to flip their, their services upside down to prepare for um, an ICU surge that totally doesn't, hasn't totally happened, that, that hasn't happened because we flattened the curve. Um, in reality, actually parks, it's, there's such a high demand for your services that actually needs to happen. So we want to be able to support you because this demand is going to, the curve is flattened and it's broadened and people are going to want to, it's going to be basically Ju July 4th, almost every day for you all. It's almost like that, that complex. And th uh, the second thing is in order to pre be prepared to really understand there's kind of three major public health method, me methods. One is policy development, two is health education, and three is enforcement. Sometimes I think some people are just really good at one thing and they focus on one thing, but, but they, these things actually have to be happen happening in concert with each other in order for there to reduce the amount of crowds. You can't just say things like, don't bring like an, a, um, an umbrella and expect that people are not, who are totally stressed out and unemployed are not gonna come see um, a beach on a sunny day when a beach is finally open. Just whenever you open that beach, everybody's going to come. So it's gonna require a really unprecedented amount of thinking about how do you combine these public health messages between parks and public health to make this happen. And the third thing is to operationalize uh, all these concepts um, into actually park services. So I think I want to hurry through this uh, I have four more minutes. Um, is like these are the three concepts. Uh, again, it's to think, uh, to redesign existing policy and programs. You know, parks have a long history of socially connecting people and uh, bringing communities together into a cohesive, loving community. But that's almost diff that's so different now, right? Because you're actually there just to almost provide nature and some type of relief from toxic stress. So it's gonna be this incredible transformation paradigm shift. Um, many people, it's like now like the park messages, I, I appreciate uh, uh, Dr. Bibbins Domingo highlighting the importance of messaging uh, to avoid misinformation and, and, and mistrust that this type of messaging needs to be carefully balanced and how can public health, healthcare and parks across the Bay Area work together to provide a uniform message of when to go to parks, what's safe to go to parks, what's really unsafe and what's actually kind of only slightly unsafe. Really difficult things to message. We need to work together to figure out what works for each community, each individual. And this third aspect is like, that if we do those first two things together, provide the right policies and provide the right information, hopefully the enforcement is going to be very limited and we'll be able to provide some advice on the grand scale of things. How important is it to ticket that paddle boarder who's paddle boarding in like San Diego County? Like is that paddle boarder the person that's gonna tip the curve to like having us not flatten the curve? So I think, you know, we at Public Health wanna to work together with public, with, uh, public parks so that we can provide enforcement uh, um, some guidance about enforcement. So I'm looking at time. So I, I think like all these concepts are in this guidance, doc, this four page guidance document that we're gonna distribute. So, and I think um, we have all these details in three different areas and they totally relate to what Dr. Dr. Rutherford commented about effective reproductive numbers. There are specific strategies to reduce the number of close contact, reduce, Actually, it's not, I'm sorry, the verb is to limit. So limit the contact, limit contact with high touch services uh, and also limit large gatherings. We're not actually trying to 
um, eliminate and we're not trying to minimize because this virus is now pretty widespread. Other states and cities are opening up and we have a, a porous border with Texas and Arizona that's, that's going to open up um, and also even Los Angeles. So um, I think I'd rather just hear from Dr. Rutherford and Dr. Vivas Domingo. So maybe just flash through this really quick. So this is just, for example, some of the details that's in this document. Um, some things in terms of like limiting size of gatherings that might be um, either duh or aha moment is like, you know, limiting like a size of gathering in which um, there's a purpose is different than limiting a public gathering in which people are there to socially mingle. Like it's not a good idea to have a 50th year wedding anniversary or 50 year like college reunion, like at the parks, right? Because people are just want to hug each other. That's why they're there. They're not there actually just to listen to a concert standing in one place. They're there to mingle with, with each other. And all of these people with the 50th year anniversary are probably 70 years old, right? So that's not a good, that's, that's not a good type of gathering. How do we actually make this into an easy policy? And some things like, for example, the limiting number of close contacts, you've, I've, I think something that might be new to you all is that for your park teams to the extent possible to um, group together in these small stable teams of park rangers that kind of like stay together over the course of a week. So in times in which you not, might need to be within six feet of each other, if you're sharing a truck together briefly, even with your mask on, that you're still in the small, still in the same small stable team. So this is just kind of a sense of uh, the practical advice that's in each of these uh, major buckets of, 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 of how to flatten the curve. So I talk about physical distancing as well too, and uh, facial coverings. Um, so I think that's it. So I, th I think I, I can always talk more in detail about any of the health officer orders, but I'd rather have more time for a Q&A with uh, Dr. Rutherford and Dr. Bevis Domingo. Thank you so much, Dr. Chan. Um, I, I really appreciate the specifics and I also, I also feel what park agencies must be um, feeling in that they're being told that they're an essential service and they provide relief to toxic stress. And yet we're also saying, but if people go outside, there will be a second wave. And yet we're also saying, we need to watch and wait. We don't know what, you know, what the next phase will be. And so I think as I um, actually invite all the panelists to um, back, be back on video, please, we can have that. I would like to direct um, the first question to Dr. Bivens Domingo, if she's here. Hi, George. Um, given that there is some uncertainty in what should be done and what kind of policies um, parks agencies should be creating how what should what should they be messaging right now to gain the most community trust and i think if we're asking them to create um, messages that will shift over time do you have any input on how to do that in a way where you gain community trust and you're not changing your message um, you know every week when there are new health orders. Is Dr. Bibbins Domingo on the call? Well, in her absence, I'll answer the question. Okay. I, I, I think consistency is important, as you said, Nushin. Yeah. I think it's really important you can't be jumping around on these messages. Uh, and I think the, the message to people has to be that the parks are safe. Um, and that you're going to, you know, and you're going to keep, you're going to have them put together in a way that people can maintain social distance and, you know, and not get, not get sick while, not get infected while they're there. I think that's sort of your first, that needs to be your first message. I'm really, um, I'm really happy to hear you put that very succinctly. And um, can you, George, it would be really good, Dr. Rutherford to hear you visualize social distancing out loud. 
and that that is possible and can still keep the, the curve flat if people are outdoors but socially distant? Well, the way to keep the curve flat is to not have, not have people get infected. And the way you don't get people infected is to have people at uh, sort of double arm's length, that's about six feet, uh, and, um, and wearing masks and giving each other, you know, giving each other some, some room unless they're in the, from the same household. Right. Now, I don't, I don't know if you guys saw the pictures of Buena Vista Park last weekend, but it was, you know, it's like a mob scene, right? It looks like the, looks like the beaches, you know, that, that Governor Newsom is also so displeased with. Um, and I, I think, you know, we got to, uh, we, if people are going to go to the parks, which I think they should, and I think Curtis is right, that, you know, this is a great way to vent toxic stress, um, that we have to assure them that they'll be, they'll be safe there. I, I think you, you may have to be handing out masks at the gate if people don't have them. Uh, I think you may have to uh, write tickets if people are, are, are not, are failing to socially distance. Um, somehow there has to be a disincentive um, or in incentives. The incentive is you're not going to get sick and die. That seems to be a pretty good incentive to me, but it's a kind of future, it's a future statement, right? Um, and I, I'd be, um, I'd be, uh, uh, I, th I think it's one thing to say it. It's another thing to give them the tools and the tools are masks and to lay, get, have a layout in a way, as the governor said, Roll out the blueprints. Let's figure this out, and 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 have people uh, be able to create some distance uh, between themselves without it being weird or socially awkward or or whatever. Well, thank you so much. I'm um, I'm gonna actually invite um, Dr. Rohan Radhakrishna um, to join the discussion. He's the deputy health officer for Contra Costa County, and he's also the author. Um, of the, the letter that um, Dr. Chan um, showed, which was guidance for parks. Um, Dr. Radhakrishna, can you address what Dr. Rutherford was saying um, in terms of uh, real techniques that parks may want to employ to have social distancing? Um, and while you do that, I'm actually going to start reading from some of the questions coming from the audience. Great. Well, I want to start by thanking all the audience for joining in. You're virtually voting with your feet around the passion for this topic and to our previous speakers. Um, I agree with Dr. Rutherford that simplicity and consistency is essential as we take a regional approach to this. I also think speaking to deeper human values around care and concern for each other, around compassion, uh, around abundance, is important and to include the people we're trying to reach in the design using basic principles of human-centered design if we're trying to reach people from different age groups or different language or cultural backgrounds in the social messaging in the social media in the signage is essential if we're worried about the old young divide of youth not complying that we engage them with uh, the the power to be involved in the process and I think to highlight the underlying inequities in that discussion to talk about uh, safe park use as an antidote for everyone during a pandemic time that's prolonged to address some of the issues that Dr. Bivens Domingo brought up will be essential. So I, we've already heard anecdotes of people policing each other and the park experience becoming an aggravating and frustrating one. And that's the, the last thing that we want. Um, and we acknowledge that the park staff are undergoing a tremendous challenge as all industries are. And we think applying some common principles that all industries and sectors are going through right now will be important. So, for example, when healthcare went from the paper chart to the electronic chart, it was a chaotic time. Right now, for our schools, going from the classroom to virtual learning is very chaotic for teachers and families. And similarly, park workforce is and will be going through that challenge that life as we know it with these new rules 
rules in place will be very disruptive and different, but the principles of creativity, of innovation, of change management, uh, of compassion will be important. So while we take these measures out of an abundance of caution, I think we also want an abundance of patience that we're all undergoing stress, those engaging in the parks, those managing the parks for safety, and that we want um, to have simplicity in messaging. So I appreciate that Dr. Rutherford started with parks are safe and being outdoor is essential as long as some basic tenants are followed. So there's not as much fear. When uh, I gave the first press conference for our first case in early March in Contra Costa County, we said there's actually four epidemics going on. There's the epidemic of the virus. There's also the epidemic of fear, the third epidemic of misinformation, and the fourth epidemic of stigma. And I think all of those can play out in the parking lots and trails of our open spaces as well. The xenophobia, the false information, the fear of others, um, maybe not following in the same way. And I think as all good Samaritans and residents of the Bay Area, it's up to us to message and reinforce and combat all four of those epidemics at the same time with positive, consistent messaging. Thank you so much. That was extremely helpful. Um, one broad category of, of questions that we're getting, Dr. Rutherford, if you could um, help answer this, is a question about timing. And if, if indeed, um, like Dr. Radha Krishna says, this is a time to ramp up the workforce and messaging of park districts, how much time do they have to change everything? And how long will those changes need to last? That's a good question. Um, how, fast do we have to, how fast do we have to change stuff? I, I think we have to have some of this in place before we let people sort of stream back in and and start infecting each other. Um, you know, I mean, I think, you know, kind of some of this, some of these pictures we see are probably pretty extreme. They look like the arrivals lounge at O'Hare Airport, you know, when they, when they, everybody flew back from Europe on the same day. Um, but I think it's, um, uh, I think you, you probably need to get it going, you need to get going soon, at least with the, with the big things. Now you can use cones, you don't have to rearrange all the Parking lots, um, you can put use markers uh, to get flow in, in certain directions. Uh, you can put uh, box of, boxes of masks or have somebody handing out masks uh, as you come through, it's like the grocery stores do now. And along um, those any, lines, any, oh, sorry. sorry, go ahead. Well, along those lines, there are quite a few questions asking um, when we change the shape of the curve. I think you, you talked about the area under the curve, but. Mm -hmm. At some point, is everybody going to get this? Like, no, is, absolutely not. Vaccine, how do pandemics end? The pandemic ends with a vaccine. We it's have a simple so choice. What happens? We have a simple choice. The, the projected mortality in the Bay Area, with the early projections, when the absence of doing anything, were between 34 and 44,000. 34 and 44,000 people. So far, there have been 272 deaths. So. You know, each each death is tragic. Each death leaves a family behind. Each death may have been preventable, but it's 272 and not 34 to 44,000. Okay. If we let everybody get it, we'll have a large number of deaths, possibly not that many, but certainly big numbers. And at the end of the day, having gotten the disease doesn't necessarily confer immunity. I, I don't know if people have have, have gotten this message clearly, but having antibody doesn't equal being immune. Um, there's a certain class of antibody you have that, not ev that you need that not everybody has in their naturally occurring immune function. And that's the type of antibody we're trying to stimulate through vaccine development. So letting everybody get it doesn't really make everybody immune. It just means that everybody got it and they can all get it again and again and again, probably. If, or if they don't have the right kind of, uh, of antibody. So, you know, this has to end with vaccine. Most, most viral epidemics end with uh, suscept exhausting the susceptible pool. But, you know, because the susceptible pool doesn't really go away here, okay. you, can get, you may be able to get reinfected. We don't know that yet. But assume you could get reinfected, you could just keep getting reinfected. And, with, you know, with risk of mortality each time. 
So, so I guess we're saying parks are safe, but, but those principles of um, reducing infection are actually quite important. And they they're should. not only important for this, you know, they're important for influenza, which kills 32,000 people a year in the United States, but for which we have a vaccine and good tests and antiviral drugs. Um, you know, they're, these are important. This is important stuff. And as long as humans keep pushing into new ecosystems, like in southern China, and start mixing and keep mixing with, you know, with species we have not had lots of experience with before, like horseshoe bats and pangolins and stuff. Um, it's, you know, we're going to continue to have these kinds of outbreaks from time to time. Now, is it every 20 years, like from SARS to here? Will it be a primarily a nosocomially transmitted disease like SARS and MERS? Or will it be more general population like uh, SARS-CoV-2? I don't think we, you know, I can't answer that question right off the bat, but we know that influenza A, continued emergence of influenza A is a threat. Um, these beta coronaviruses are, are more, are, it's not a one-time deal. This could happen again quite easily. Um, so I'm, I, I would hope that a lot of these lessons stick. Just like the lessons about, about recycling stick and the lessons about conserving water stick. Um, and I think we'll see some stuff stick, like a little bit of social distancing. You may see people wearing masks if they're sick, right? On, 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 you know, on BART or whatever. I hope not everybody gets in their car and drives everywhere. That would be, that causes a whole other set of problems. But you got to, you know, you got to get it figured out. There's got to be some sort of happy medium here. So I, I hear that, that life will be different. Um, the good news is people that work in the outdoors are very creative. They're going to figure this out. They're so they have all that good both. ultraviolet radiation beaming down, I'm according to the president today. That's true. You're, um, I'm just going to bypass that and <laughs> keep going. Um, we are getting a ton of questions about personal protective equipment as well as um, issues with bathrooms and trash. We are planning to deal with those questions um, in depth on the next session, but I just wanted to ask Dr. Chan or Dr. Radhakrishna if they wanted to say anything about that now because we, we are getting a lot of questions along those lines. Dr. Chan, please. Dr. Radhakrishna. <laughs> sure. Um, again, we're happy to continue to work with parks for details. We're also providing that level of guidance for all workers. Uh, think of the people at your grocery store, at your pharmacy that have already been engaged on the front lines doing essential work, protecting themselves in higher risk situations, just to put it in context, indoor, closer proximity, longer duration, looking at some of the metrics of risk that Dr. Chan mentioned. And uh, we as your local health officers will continue to provide guidance for every sector based on the types of interactions you have with the public to be safe. We've put out some of that guidance uh, in terms of what is necessary and what may be optional. So the cloth face cover of covering the nose and mask is important. Uh, there are concerns getting into hotter months uh, for particular guidance around it, but we do know that there is a lot of asymptomatic and pre-symptomatic transmission. So it could be speaking with spit, not just coughing or sneezing that could transmit the virus. Again, if in close proximity for a longer period of time, we do know that the virus in the upper respiratory tract can uh, replicate more than compared to influenza and other viruses. Therefore, that face cover is one of the most important ones we're recommending at the current time. As for sanitation, trash and restrooms, the routine precautions uh, should be adequate. Um, gloves and uh, if doing higher risk things that may create aerosolization, an eye cover, but for routine trash pickup, nothing more than gloves and or the mask in case you come into contact with others. Um, we just want to remind people that bathrooms and trash are being serviced at all the essential facilities the grocery stores, the pharmacies, and the outdoor environments would be lower risk overall, um, but also essential for sanitation and hygiene. So we'll get into it more in the next session. 
And uh, please give us feedback if we can offer more specific guidance documents for you all to feel comfortable and safe. Um, since we know um, essential work is putting everyone at risk. And we also want to acknowledge that this is a moment that's a time for a, a call to arms. More Americans have died from coronavirus than the Vietnam War as of this week. Um, my colleagues are being deployed to the Navajo Reservation right now as if they're soldiers to help with this outbreak. And our grocery checkers and our pharmacy retail workers, as well as our park staff are on that front line as well. So we want to be in this together. We're going to be telling our relatives and grandchildren about what we did during this time and how we served our mission and assisted the public. And we want to do that at the same time while being safe and also being reasonable and conserving our resources in a responsible way. So we're here for you and we thank you for being there for the community. Mm, thank you so much for that. Thank you. Um, I'm going to do one last question before, or one group of questions before we start wrapping up. And this one is for Dr. Chan. And Dr. Chan, you have to take it. Sure. <laughs> um, there are quite a few questions talking about um, the potential inequitable consequences of some of the policies around park closures and specifically around closures um, or rules that are coming up limiting park access by geography so that only people that live near certain parks can get to them um, and also rules around certain sports. Um, a few people have asked about, you know, golf and tennis often get called out, whereas basketball and soccer may not get called out. And so can you talk, can you speak to that? How can a park district think about socially distancing people um, without exacerbating inequities? Or is that possible? Uh, I think that you know, I think that's a great question. I just, and I just want to say I deferred to Rohan because I knew he had a great answer for that. And Contra Costa has been working on that and to give him some more air time as well. I, I think this is something that parks would love to work. I mean, the health, public health wants to work with parks about. And just to understand the structural issues about this, uh, Dr. Bibi's Domingo highlighted it. It's, it's easy to be, I mean, this is our 51st day of social distancing. Um, of children who might have be multiple families uh, with young children in a single household. So there's, there's a point where I don't totally agree with Dr. Rutherford here. It's that, you know, it's not, it's not pure science that if we don't actually allow, uh, I mean, both of us agree that parks should be open and they need to be safe. But if, um, as you saw that childcare agencies and after school programs are gonna be open, if kids are not going to parks, um, uh, especially if they live in very crowded conditions, they're going to be uh, in somebody's backyard or in a street corner playing together anyways. Nobody is not, I mean, uh, children and young adults are not going to be, act, they're actually not socially isolating themselves um, for these last 50 days. And things are just going to, they're more, go, there's going to be actually more mixing in private instead of in the public open space and we're going to not keep the curve flattened if we don't allow parks which should be um, parks are the land of the people um, in each city and each county so um, you know and i think that in terms of the, the the structural issues yes i mean i think the park directors and even the elected officials have informed us that people whose houses are closest to the parks are oftentimes the people who are the park commissioners who have the loudest voice in terms of advocating for less traffic jams by the parks. So then it reduces access to, to, to those who actually have to drive a longer distance to parks. And those are the people who actually live in crowded conditions in multi-unit housing, um, in you know apartments that share the same lobby and those are where like the the east part of san francisco that's where the highest rates of infection are where people live in much more crowded conditions and that's where there's fewer parks so they do need to drive further to golden gate park in san francisco to be able to have you know a bit of relaxation because they've been unemployed uh, for the last five weeks you know, they, they do need that toxic stress. And if that is not available, um, 
then you know worse outcomes happen from toxic stress um, such as chronic disease or or violence you know or substance use because those are our only coping me mechanisms for, for for toxic stress so i think just in summary these inequities are inherent in our societies so you know we in parks and we in public health have to work together as a way to reverse these inequities and just to think about safe ways in which we can allow our public spaces to be as safe as possible because they are open space. They are by definition places where there's more physical distancing here in parks than at the mall or basically, or even on sidewalks, which are only five feet wide. And your trails are actually, many of them are at least eight feet wide. So I just want to say, um, you know, I think it's, you know, there's a lot of fear of the unknown and actually a lot is unknown. And we have to be not just, we have to better understand what our risks are. Um, and, you know, we're, we're going through this in every single sector. Rohan and I are talking to different sector leaders about this. And I think that's, this is where we need to work together and you all need to work together with each other to better understand what are the practical ways to address this. Thank you so much, Dr. Chen. Um, Dr. Rutherford, did you want to say anything before we wrap up? No, okay. Well, thank you each. It's actually time is up. Um, I'm going to um, show a link, if you can all see it. Um, we really hope that you can join us next week. And I know a lot of what was said today is that we need to work together and we need to come up with solutions. And I hope that doesn't sound like we're saying you're we don't know or your questions aren't important. It's more an invitation to be part of this process. Um, and so for that, the first link is um, a survey which will really help us know what are the major issues that parks are facing and also what are the major strategies they are undertaking um, in order for us to get some dialogue and discussion on them. Um, and then the second link is to sign up for next week's lecture series I have had a few questions from nonprofits and non-parks outdoor people, Dr. Chan, on how they can join the discussion. Uh, if you could just pr just provide some suggestions on how we could join that, that discussion. I think we've been meeting through Bay Area together as well, too. So I yeah, think that's I one. Think, yeah, if you can, if you fill out the survey and indicate that your agency is interested in being part of a regional um, statement or movement, then we can move that forward as well. Um, but I really, really thank the panelists. Dr. Bivens Domingo had an urgent phone call and she had to leave. She really apologizes. Um, I'm really just thrilled that um, public health and academic leaders are willing to engage. Um, I do want to make a plug for more data on the issue of parks. I always hear stuff about school closures and how they impact the pandemic, but I think parks um, are really thirsty for understanding how their policies um, impact pandemics as well. Thank you each, and uh, we will see you next week. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, park folks.